Hello and welcome to Talking Flutes. I'm Jean-Paul Wright. A big shout out must go to our fabulous Talking Flutes podcast sponsors based just outside of London, TJ Flutes. Please show them some flute love by following them on Instagram at TJ Flutes or Facebook at Trevor James Flutes. Today, and following some questions that we received a few weeks ago on the subject, we're taking the opportunity to look back at one of Claire's earlier podcasts recorded in 2019 on a brief history of the flute. So much is written about technique and performance, and yet many flute players know very little about the origins and developments of the modern flute, and it's fascinating. In all the years that I was teaching at conservatoire level, I don't think I ever taught a student who had willingly read any books about flute history, which surprised me as I had always thought that if you were passionate about a subject, you would find out as much as possible about it. Certainly in my hobbies of cooking and golfing, I'm constantly reading up and learning as much as I can. Also, knowing a little bit about flute history will help you as performers understand and interpret different musical styles. Compositions for flute developed alongside the technical developments. The modern flute is easy to play at a simple level, but not so easy at an advanced level, where you need to be able to play in tune, control the sound, fingers and articulation. There are so many variables. In short, a flute consists of a tube of metal or wood, a bit more than 65 centimetres long and 2 centimetres in diameter, close at one end with a stopper or a cork. Near the stopper is the mouth hole and then there are 11 or so holes along the body. Flutes are comprised of a large group of instruments, simple and sophisticated, including many different shapes and sizes, all with one common feature. To make them work, the player blows an airstream across the mouth hole into a hollow tube. So let's whiz through a very brief history. A vulture bone flute discovered in a European cave is probably the world's oldest recognisable musical instrument, and that was 40,000 years ago. It was also found with fragments of mammoth ivory flutes. So this is evidence that music may have given the first modern Europeans an advantage over the Neanderthals. Music could have been a way of communication for modern humans and help form social bonds. The earliest transverse flute pictures in Western culture appeared in the 10th century. The biggest developments, though, happened in the 17th century, with many changes and alterations. Hotter was primarily responsible for adding a D-sharp key to the six-hole transverse flute. Flutes were made using hardwoods such as boxwood, ebony or cocos wood. His flute was in three sections, head joint, main body and foot joint, with the D-sharp key. Later on, he introduced another section to help with pitch control. He also developed the first conical bore flute, keeping the head joint cylindrical and making the tone hole smaller. He was the author of the first tutor book for Baroque flute in 1707. There were always pitch problems, and Scarlatti wrote, I cannot endure wind instrument players. They all play out of tune. The 18th century saw the flute flourish, but was also the time that the defects became increasingly irritating. Intonation was very poor because of the uneven scale and finger holes spaced too far apart. There were over 1,800 known tutor books for the Baroque flute, which tells us how difficult it must have been. But the flute was becoming very popular as a solo instrument, although most professionals played oboe as their principal instrument. In 1740, C.P. Bach was appointed as composer and keyboard player to the court of King Frederick the Great, and Quantz, who was his flute teacher, as musical director in Berlin. Quantz wrote one of the most important books for flute players, called Essay of a Method for Playing the Transverse Flute, dedicated to the king. His introductory letter to the king begins, Most serene, great and mighty king, most gracious king and master, in deepest humility may I venture to dedicate the present pages to your royal highness. These essays are fascinating to read. Quantz didn't want to train mechanical players, but intelligent musicians. Chapters include holding and finger placement, scales, embouchure, articulation, breathing, ornaments, cadenzas and instructions for those players accompanying the flute. It's the most wonderful book for learning about Baroque performance. 
By the latter half of the 18th century, Mozart and Hofmeister had written solo concertos, and many flute players wrote their own, like de Vienne. There were a few outstanding players, like Quantz and his successor, Wendling, but still many problems are about intonation. Mozart was quoted to say of Wendling, He is not a piper, and one need not always be in terror for fear the next note should be too high or too low. He is always right. He does not imagine that blowing and making faces is all that is needed. He knows too what adagio means. And for those who don't know, it means at ease. The flute continued to be developed with new keys added, four, six and eight keyed flutes, but there was no standard flute. All flutes from the one keyed through to the eight keyed were being played into the 19th century. This century saw much controversy and confusion with regards to the development of the flute. There were many people trying to improve and experiment it. Even so, the flute was becoming increasingly popular because it was now capable of more advanced technique. By 1800, Doulon and Druth were famous virtuosi, playing around Europe, and concertos, fantasies and variations were very popular. In the 1820s, enthusiasm for the flute was said to be like a mania. It was estimated that in London, in 1829, one man in ten played the flute. There's no mention of women here. There was so much competition between players, teachers and composers to gain a share of this huge market for all things flute, even including walking stick flutes. I've never seen or played one before, but Jean-Paul Wright was telling me that he has one. Maybe he'll play it for us in his next podcast. The 19th century saw the developments creating the flute we play today, and that happened because of Theobald Bowen, a man of such vision, musicianship and skill. Bowen was a very accomplished performer, with great success, apart from in London, where he had to compete with Charles Nicholson. Nicholson had a huge, powerful sound, helped by large tone holes and a great technique. Bohm is quoted as saying, I did as well as any continental flautist could have done in London in 1831, but I could not match Nicholson in power of tone. Wherefore, I set to work to remodel my flute. Had I not heard him, probably the Bohm flute would never have been made. By the 1840s, the symphony orchestra regularly included flutes and had larger string sections, so all instruments were playing louder. Bohm developed a ring-keyed flute, which was adopted by Brussels, but not Paris. Toul disliked it, saying it sounded like a trumpet. But when Toul retired, the Bohm flute was made the official instrument of the conservatoire. Bohm made many modifications and attracted much attention from the players of the day. In 1841, John Clinton, who was Professor of Flute at the Royal Academy of Music in London, adopted the new Bohm flute, and two years later, Rudel and Cart did the same. The only change was to the open G sharp, now changed to closed. 1847 was the final developmental stage of Bohm's flute. It now had a cylindrical tube with a conical head joint. In 1860, Louis Doris introduced the Bohm flute at the Paris Conservatoire, Louis Lott became the official maker of the flutes and silver flutes were becoming more common. Baroque and early music, though, was almost forgotten. By the end of the 19th century, many principal flutists adopted the Bohm system and composers such as Strauss, Brahms and Tchaikovsky were using flutes much more. The end of this century was the time when Paul Taffanel was professor of flute at the Paris Conservatoire and thanks to him, works by Bach and Mozart were revived and he commissioned works by Goddard, Vidor and Sanson. He raised the level of performance and technique and was the founder of the French flute school of flute playing. In 1894, Debussy wrote Prelude à la Primidi, giving the flute a new musical prominence, never seen or heard before. So the 19th century was a time of much confusion, and in comparison, the 20th century was much calmer. The bone flute was now accepted as the best system, and there were also recordings. The most prominent female flutist of the 20s was Edith Penville, and unfortunately not much is known about her. She played a Rudelkart Bohm system flute, and there is a recording of her playing. She learnt with Daniel S. Wood at the Royal Academy of Music in London, and lived to the ripe old age of 100. 
But even though there were some women soloists, women were excluded from orchestral positions until after World War II. The 1930s saw Japanese and American companies all producing silver flutes, and in Europe, German and English players were adapting to the French style of playing with vibrato, influenced mainly by Marcel Moyes. Choice of materials is perhaps one of the most talked about aspects of modern flutes. When silver flutes first appeared, Wagner said, those are not flutes, they are cannons. There's another quote from the early 20th century. For many years, there has been discussion and argument on the question of the influence of the wall of material of a woodwind instrument on its tonal quality. These arguments probably started in early Stone Age musical circles with assertions that a flute made out of human thigh bone had a better tone than one fashioned from the rib of a sabre-toothed tiger. Wooden flutes stayed in British orchestras well into the 50s as they blended so well with the other woodwinds. But generally, the modern orchestra needs the brilliance and volume of silver flutes. There were three very influential players in the early 20th century that helped establish silver flutes. Marcel Moyes, Geoffrey Gilbert and William Kincaid. Kincaid said, In my opinion, a wood flute has a very steady sound, although it seems inflexible and solid. To me, a fine metal flute has a sound which floats and is pliant. Today's flutes are still made out of many different materials, wood, silver, gold, platinum and plastic. The scale has been altered and adjusted many times and extra keys have been added to help general technique. The foot joint has been lengthened to add a low B and most flutes are open hold. There are also some very innovative developments. For example, the Kingma system, which is a quarter tone flute with six extra keys, allowing you to play a quarter tone scale over the range of the instrument. As well as this, the additional keys allow you to play a large number of multiphonics in chromatic progressions and even triple stops. The flute I play is a platinum Miyazawa, which has the Brugger system. This makes the mechanism far more stable with less chance of things going wrong. The spring tension of each key can be adjusted, which results in an even feel throughout the flute. I've had many flutes throughout my career. I started with an unknown make, a flute which only cost £20. Then I moved on to a Yamaha, followed by a Muramatsu, which had been tuned by Albert Cooper with a Cooper head joint. Then I progressed to an Almeida, to which I added a Louis Lott head joint, which was fantastic and I loved it. I also bought two old French flutes, a Labrette and a Louis Lott. But I remember clearly trying a Platinum Miyazawa and not quite believing how it sounded and how it responded. So I knew immediately that I had to sell everything in order to buy a Platinum Miyazawa flute, which I did. That then is my very brief history of the flute. I wonder what advances, if any, will be made in the next few decades. Thank you so much for listening. Claire may be my co-host, but please don't forget to check out her own website, clairesouthworthflute.com, for all her music and publication resources. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Talking Flutes and please rate and like us and whatever podcast provider you're listening to this on. Next week, in what is probably one of my favourite podcasts and also one of the earliest we did, Claire speaks to the brilliant musician and seriously lovely guy Wissam Bustani. So until then, wishing you a musically fulfilling week ahead. And may you not get tongue-tied with your tiki 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 or thaka thaka thaka, because I usually do. <laughs> Goodbye. Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.